In this third part of the chapter two material, I'm going to discuss three things. We'll talk about the profitability ratios. We'll talk about valuation or market value ratios. And finally, I'll explain why the DuPont identity is so important. Now, we have three primary measures of profitability in finance. There are others out there, but everyone knows these three. The first is the profit margin, and that's simply net income divided by total sales. Uh, so it represents how much of every dollar of revenue is profit, goes to your bottom line, in other words. Next, we have return on assets and return on equity. Return on assets is net income divided by total assets, and return on equity is obviously net income divided by total equity. For all three of these, the larger, the better. Now, I will say there are a couple of points that need to be mentioned. First off, the larger the leverage, in other words, the larger the amount that the firm borrows, the larger the ROA is going to be relative to the ROE. Uh, now, ROE is often used as a measure of how well management is attaining the goal of wealth maximization for the shareholders. ROE is sometimes referred to as ROI, or return on investment. Now, as with many of the other ratios, there are variations in how these can be calculated. The most important thing is to make sure that when you're computing them, you're computing them the same way across all the firms that you're examining, and also making sure that you're using the same formula through time. All right, let's take a look at an example of how we use these three profitability ratios. So I've provided Macy's balance sheet and its income statement for the year uh, for the end of fiscal year 2016. Our profit margin, like I said, is net income divided by total sales. So we're just taking net income off the income statement and dividing it by total sales off the income statement. And we find that Macy's profit margin is 3.96%. Our ROA in this case is just net income off the income statement divided by total assets off the balance sheet. And that's 5.21%. As we mentioned, in the last part, there are some other ways to measure ROA and ROE. Uh, one thing that financial analysts will sometimes do is take the average of total assets over a given year. So they'll take total assets at the end of the fiscal year and then average that with the total assets at the end of the previous fiscal year, and that'll give them their average total assets that's used to calculate a return on assets. Return on equity, in this case, is just net income divided by total equity, and that's just 1,072 divided by 4,250, and our ROE here is 25.2. Now, because ROA is taking into account the debt as well as the equity, ROA is always going to be equal to or less than our ROE. So ROE just represents return on the shareholder's equity, whereas ROA represents the return on both the debt that the firm has borrowed and the equity that the firm has issued. Next, we have market value measures. And market value measures provide an indication of how valuable the firm currently is relative to some metric on its financial statements. We have some frequently used ratios. Uh, so the three most common are typically the PE ratio, the earnings per share, and the market to book ratio. The PE ratio is probably the most well known. There are two formulas for the PE ratio, forward PE and trailing PE. Forward PE ratios are calculated as the market price per share listed on a stock exchange divided by the net income per share forecasted over the next year by some analyst. Trailing PE ratios are calculated as the market price per share listed on a stock exchange divided by the historical net income per share over the previous fiscal year. Earnings per share, or EPS, is net income divided by number of shares outstanding. It tells us how much in total income each share earned over the course of a quarter or a year. The market to book ratio is used slightly less frequently, but it's the market price per share listed on the stock exchange divided by the book price per share listed on the balance sheet. Market value ratios tell us how valuable investors believe the firm's stock is right now relative to its historical metrics. For example, the P.E. ratio tells us how much investors would be willing to pay for $1 of current earnings per share. The higher this number is, the higher the expected growth prospects of the firm, as indicated by investors. For example, Amazon has historically had a very high P.E. ratio. As of right now, it's 9192 
This means that investors would be willing to pay $91.92 for $1 of, of current earnings per share. Meanwhile, firms that are more mature, like Ford, have P.E. ratios typically below about 15. Currently, Ford's P.E. ratio is 5.69. Valuation experts would often say in this case that this low P.E. ratio indicates undervaluation. Now, a couple of final points on market value measures. First, these ratios can only be computed for publicly traded firms. Second, negative P.E. ratios are reported as either N.A. or blank. We never report negative P.E. ratios. All right, let's take a look at an example. So Ford's market share price is $16. The book value of equity, or total equity divided by shares outstanding, is $6. That's just our book price per share. The firm had earnings of $7.1 billion in 2013, and the firm had or has 4 billion shares outstanding. What are the earnings per share, P.E. ratio, and market to book ratio? Well, the earnings per share is calculated fairly simply. It's just our net income divided by number of shares outstanding. So in this case, we have EPS of 1.775, which we normally round to 1.78. Our P.E. ratio in this case is 16 divided by 1.775. So in this case, this would be our trailing P.E. ratio. So our trailing P.E. ratio, because we're using historical net income, is 9.014. Finally, our market to book ratio is just the market share price, or $16 in this case, divided by the book share price of 6. And this gives us a market to book ratio of 2.667, which is relatively high. Now, there are a couple other commonly used market value measures. The first is the EBITDA ratio, but to use that or to calculate that, I also need to talk about the enterprise value. So I'll talk about the enterprise value first, and then we'll incorporate it in the EBITDA ratio. All right, so the enterprise value of a firm is the total value of the firm at market price. In other words, it's the market value of the firm's equity as well as the market value of its liabilities minus its cash. The reason enterprise value is so important is because it represents the value that if you were wanting to buy this company, you would have to pay. Now, as you can probably see from the formula I have here, the way we normally calculate it is by taking our market cap, that's the total market value of shares outstanding, plus book value of all the liabilities minus cash. A few seconds ago, I mentioned that we are taking the market value of all of these things. But the reason we use book value of liabilities instead of market value of liabilities is because in most cases, we really can't get the market value of liabilities. So the book value of all liabilities is typically our best proxy. Now, as for the market cap, the way we calculate that is by simply taking the market price per share times the shares outstanding. Our book price of all liabilities is simply just our bottom line of liabilities, just total liabilities, or all liabilities on the balance sheet. Finally, our cash is literally just the cash line item on the balance sheet. So let's take a look at Ford's enterprise value. So in this previous example, Ford had a market share price of $16. It had about 4 billion shares outstanding, that meant that its market cap was 16 times 3.995 billion, or 63.92 billion. The book value of all of its debt, or liabilities, is about 114 billion, and it had 14 billion and change in cash. So the enterprise value of Ford is just 63.92 billion, its market cap, plus 114.7-ish billion, minus the cash on hand of 14. 5-ish billion, or 164.14 billion. Now, this is the price that if you were going to buy Ford Motor Company, you would likely have to pay. Now, realistically, if you wanted to buy this company, you'd probably have to pay a touch more than this in order to compensate investors for selling their shares or selling the controlling stake of this company. But this is the price of Ford as of this point in time. All right, now I mentioned the enterprise value. The reason I mention that is because it's the numerator in what's called the EBITDA ratio. And the EBITDA ratio is another measure of market value. The higher this ratio, the more highly valued the firm is. 
And the enterprise value is just, like I said, our numerator in this case. Uh, the way we calculate EBITDA ratio is just enterprise value divided by earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Now, some firms will actually report this directly. Other firms, you'll have to take the EBIT and then add in depreciation and amortization. Now, this ratio, like the PE ratio and like the market-to-book ratio, is yet another measure of the expected future growth prospects of a firm. The higher it is, the more investors are willing to pay for a dollar of current income. All right, so in Ford's case, if we know that the EBITDA is $7.001 billion, and our enterprise value is what we calculated as $1.64 billion, our EBITDA ratio, or enterprise value divided by EBITDA, is just 2345 the reason this is important is that if we wanted to compare Ford to GM or, say, another automobile manufacturer, and Ford's EBITDA ratio was far lower than that of its direct competitors, this might indicate that Ford is less highly valued than its direct competitors. In other words, we might be able to buy Ford and realize a much higher return than if we were to purchase shares of GM if GM's EBITDA ratio was, let's say, 30 or 35. All right, the last topic we have for this part of the Chapter 2 material is the DuPont identity, or the DuPont equation. Now, many times, ratios for a firm will give a conflicting picture of performance. The DuPont ratio, or the DuPont identity, provides a way to break down ROE, or return on equity, and investigate what areas of the firm need improvement. The DuPont identity indicates that a firm's return on equity depends on three characteristics. Its operating efficiency, as proxied by the profit margin, asset use efficiency, as proxied by the total asset turnover, and financial leverage, as proxied by the equity multiplier. We can use ROE and these numbers to examine exactly where a firm is struggling. Now, the DuPont identity isolates these three areas and allows us to determine where we're underperforming. So for example, if our total asset turnover is high and our equity multiplier is high, yet our profit margin is low, this might indicate that our firm is not controlling costs, and therefore we should focus on that and see perhaps what's going on. If perhaps the firm's profit margin is very large and the equity multiplier is also very large, yet the firm has very low total asset turnover relative to its direct competitors, this indicates that the firm is inefficiently using its assets. This could potentially indicate that firm management is not acting as efficiently as it should. Now, in conclusion, we just saw there are several profitability measures that are frequently used by financial analysts. With all of them, the higher the better. The market value ratios we see allow us to examine how valuable investors believe a firm currently is. So the higher the market value ratio, typically the more highly investors are valuing the firm. And finally, the DuPont equation, or the DuPont identity, can be used to spot weaknesses in the firm's operations.